You're listening, You're to, listening radio. to Radio Free, radio Satan. free Satan. Com. Com. Enjoy the show. I'd like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I'm your host, Adam Campbell. It's great to have you. It's June 23rd, and I've got a great show for you this week. That's right, a great show. Let me speak to that for a second, if I may. I try, every week, to bring you a show worth your time. Let's be honest. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. But I always try. The reality is, um, there's an infinite number of topics I could discuss on any given week. And the chance of you being in tune with one or more of them is pretty small. So I do what I can. I work with... uh, and, And here's like the biggest time consumer, is the arranging of guests. The searching potential worthwhile conversations, the uh, delivery and editing. I mean, there's a lot that goes into producing this show, and it's all on me. This speaks to uh, some recent concerns of mine, uh, brought to my attention. I'm not entirely sure where we're going to be. We'll always have 9centspodcast.com, and, uh, well, we'll always have each other, uh, listener and host relationship. I can't promise that there's going to be anything beyond that. So I'm sort of in a transition phase, and uh, no matter where we end up, if you enjoy the show, if you enjoy what I bring you on a weekly basis, or whenever you tune in. I'm going to continue doing so, and I hope that you will continue to tune in and support the show. That being said, the future of Nine Cents is solid. We will continue until I just can't afford to produce the show anymore, (laughs) either financially or emotionally or just time. Um, But yeah, it's, it's pretty damn solid as of now. I have a lot of new segments uh, new as in to nine cents obviously for a year now we've been running down the crossroads with Aaron which has been well warmly accepted by you and I truly appreciate it because I I love it recently Darren D is side with agent provocateur I'm, I'm very excited and he put together a great I, and I have to tell you, like I, I listen to the segments and the whole podcast, really, once in editing. Uh, whenever it's a segment, I'll listen to it once, and then I'll edit it once if it needs any editing, but I'll still listen to it. And then afterward, I'll listen to it once. Because I like to listen to my show to find fault and try to improve it. Sometimes I pay attention to the faults, and sometimes I don't. Um, I'm human, and I have a limited time to work on this baby. Um, I listened to Darren's episode like three times because it was that good. Like there was some really uh, clever references and sort of just cultural jabs in it. I hope everyone got, and if you didn't, listen to it again. It, it, it was good. It was really good. And um, 
obviously recently I've been helping and I'm hoping to have her on the show to speak directly to the segment but I dream of Jessie and she's an amazing woman with a truly powerful voice that I think is a benefit to everyone involved and so I'm, I'm very pleased that I'm able to bring her of course last week um, Majdra Igrain delivered her second verbal essay to the podcast and I was very excited for that I don't know how much that will continue going on because of other developments but I always love having her on whenever she's willing and uh, today this particular week of this particular month it's been teased for a number of weeks and in development for a number more weeks militant eroticism I'm excited for this and I hope I hope you dig it because it's it's poignant it's educated which is what is most important to me ironically because I sort of just spew spew uneducated thoughts out of my head all damn week um, Adin has he's got a really original perspective on things and I think it's of worth certainly to men and women uh, out there but also to Satanists and let's face it at its core that's what nine cents is it's about Satanists so I hope you enjoy it and I I hope that you'll connect with him on Facebook on his Facebook page militant eroticism look it up and you know what shoot me an email at info at nine cents podcast.com or connect with him on a message on his Facebook page about the segment and let him know what you think let me know what you think of it and I'll pass it on um, it's it's some good stuff I was reluctant to I'm always reluctant to bring anyone else in to this podcast because I created nine cents myself and I sort of um, fostered and raised it to what it is and and I'm a very controlling individual at my core anyway it's really challenging for me to bring other voices on and to allow them a sort of carte blanche expression time and I, I've learned <laughs> it's hard for me but I've learned that's a good thing and if you have the right people as a friend would say then it's a really good thing it can only be a good thing I'm pleased to have found the right people as of yet and I'm very pleased with the future nine cents has it's uh it's bright it's diverse and it's powerful baby i mean really <laughs> you find me another podcast like this that speaks to the satanic side of existence in such a diverse way that connects with so many different satanists on so many levels and that doesn't mean you agree with everything on the show, but it means you connect with it. You show me another podcast that does that, and I'll hang my hat. It doesn't exist, and I'm very excited that I can be a part of that delivery in uh, even a, a tiny aspect as I have. And I hope you're excited about it, um, because really this is all about entertainment. This is all for you. Uh, that being said, this last weekend <laughs> was exhausting for me. So I've recently met and spoken to you about Skinned Elbow Records uh, owner. I, I recently met him, a, a local Satanist. I went to his Lucifest a couple weeks ago. And this week, he and I and our spouses attended Design of the Devil's Hand. A local Salt Lake City gallery which 
featured artists' interpretations of the devil. Herr Satan. <laughs> it was really cool. It was just... And what was great about it is it was limited in the media. So they were allowed no more than three colors, no digital representation. It all had to be offset printing, uh, screen printing. And it was much busier than I anticipated it being. I mean, really busy. They had 24 contributors and it was this letter press building sort of reconfigured for a gallery. They had this huge banner on the wall with a light projected Satan um, rotating clockwise on its surface with topography behind it. And they were selling prints of all of the artist's work. I picked up a print that I'm very, very happy. And if you follow me on social networking circles, then you'll you'll be able to see that. But um, it was it was a good time. I mean, a really good time. It's it's really rare that you're able to connect with someone, but it's this fantastic experience when you do connect with them and. I had that moment this weekend, and maybe it was one-sided, but I had that moment this weekend. I was talking to him and his wife, and I I really had a good time. I tend to talk a lot, so maybe that was a distraction, but they were polite, and they allowed me, that they afforded me that opportunity, which, of course, I appreciate. And I was able to share my passion, the home brewing, which was always fun, and meet and learn a little bit about some new human beings and that's always interesting but it was a great evening sort of amplified by this gallery uh about the devil it was it was really really cool and of course this weekend was the solstice and um we had the super moon Woo! <laughs> which which sort of just added that extra element to the whole thing and this morning um, my family and I went hiking up in um, the Wasatch Mountains. So I live in Utah, and we obviously like to go experience the outdoors, whether it's hiking or camping or whatever. We do it quite a bit, um, maybe more than maybe more than we should at times. Uh, meaning we focus more on our experience outdoors than maybe our house <laughs> chores <laughs> uh, but it's always a good time it's always it's always a lot of fun and and today was no exception so we went up hiking and this is actually i hate sort of hang my head in shame here a little embarrassed by it but we haven't gone hiking as much as we normally do this year and it's just because we've been so goddamn busy i've been busy my family's been busy life is busy um, and so we finally were able to go on it's sort of our introductory hike so what we like to do is plan out okay well this is gonna be the hardest hike that we want to do this year so we have to build up to that we sort of have to prepare for that because I have two children whom are not avid hikers obviously they're kids and so we have to build up their feet and their legs and their emotional tolerance to the hike and if you have children you understand what I'm saying and so we go on small hikes for a little bit of time and we sort of go on harder and harder and harder hikes progressively until it's not a big deal and then we can go on these hikes that we really want to go on um, you know go to these really far removed from society lakes and uh, scenic areas where we can truly be this is going to sound really weird a family unit isolated and surrounded in nature itself we're not connected to society anymore it is literally me my wife and my two children connecting at a primal level with nature in and of itself nothing in between and for us that's a big deal that's 
that's the goal. And, you know, obviously so far this year hasn't been great on it, but we are working toward it, and we've sort of made a, a resolution. I mean, we go we go camping, and when we go camping, we, we hike in to camping spots. So we do that a number of times a year. And But normally we hike a lot, like a ridiculous amount, like virtually every or every other weekend. And, and so that's sort of something that we're going to be ramping up again. And it's nice because you get a, you get to connect with your kids and you, you get to connect with your spouse in a way that you normally don't. Um, and you get to enjoy what, in my opinion, is the real world. And that's no technology no society just the plants and the earth and the weather and the sun and it's so powerful it's fantastic we haven't yet had the opportunity and if you're if you have the ability I, I highly recommend it get your ass out there take a damn walk people uh, disconnect is what I always tell my son disconnect because that is the only way that you're truly going to be able to quiet your mind, learn a little bit about yourself and those around you. And if you're in a family unit, that is imperative to do. All right. So uh, all of that being said, let's go ahead and start the show. Nine cents letters. That's right. So I received a letter from some uh, gentle men, gentle people. It was sort of a, a group letter I received, but it's surrounding satanic ritual magic, and they had some questions that I am pretty damn sure I can clarify, but more importantly, may uh, give light to others who have not, may have the same question, but have not written in or not um, looked further, though you should. Uh, and so I'll, I'll tell you what I wrote back to them and, and maybe elaborate a little bit and uh, maybe uh, you know have some value there. In the Infernal Informant on NSA disclosures, has Glenn Greenwald become something other than a reporter? And on the streets and in the courts, Egypt's Morsi is under siege. And like I already mentioned, Militant Eroticism, Episode 1, the introduction today. This was a great discussion, uh, sort of one-sided discussion, and then a little bit of follow-up afterward. Uh, either way, it's good stuff. Stay tuned for it in the second half of the show. Let's go ahead and dive into letters, nine cents letters right now. You are your father, the devil. <laughs> And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And has nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his character. For he is a liar. And the father of lies. And you are the devil's advocate. I'm a Satanist. I'm an active member in the Church of Satan, but I do not speak for the Church of Satan. That is all. All right, nine cents letters. Second episode of such. All right, so I received an email about satanic ritual magic. I'm going to read the email and then kind of give you a, a reply here. Hope you do not mind, but after reading all of the books... And listening to your shows on magic, etc., we are still a bit confused, and we're hoping you could clear something up. We heard Blanche Barton say that mag satanic magic is simply what is now called creative visualization. So, if we got books on creative visualization, would that help explain satanic ritual magic and how to perform them? The other confusing thing is when we see ourselves already having our desires and using affirmations saying that we already have what we want. Are we supposed to also feel that we already have what we want as being reality already? Two, or 
Are we supposed to see what we want to happen and feel what it will be like to have it as we expect it to now happen instead of already having it? Three. Or is it seeing what we want to have happen and feel how badly we want what we see to really happen? We can never seem to get a clear answer as to which of these three ways is the correct way. If you could please let us know, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, signed. So, <laughs> uh, my response was, you're thinking about this way too much. And certainly in a light of desire. One thing you need to realize when it comes to magic is it's, it's sort of a two-parter. And maybe even a three-parter. Uh, first of all, let me sort of lay down a disclaimer. Not every Satanist believes in ritual and magic. That's true. Not everyone does. Uh, not every Satanist practices rituals, greater magic, proper. And not every Satanist sees the same way. I'm going to give you my interpretation, and I hope it's of value. The fact that you reached out to me, I'm hoping, is going to aid to the authority of said opinion. But, again, you need to come to terms with it on your own, in your own way. So, let me give you my interpretation, my opinion. Um, desire is a catalyst for greater magic. It's, it's, it's what propels us to uh, create a ritual for lust, compassion, or revenge, vengeance, destruction at its core. I mean, these are the three basic types of rituals. First and foremost, I would suggest you read and reread and re-re-read the satanic bible until you get a firm grasp of greater magic it seems to elude a lot of people and is i think it's because we like to project what we want it to be into the words of what it actually is and it's a human thing so don't feel bad There's nothing wrong with it but that is just what we do we want it to be something, and so when we read it, we use that lens to see it, rather than the lens it was actually written, uh, reality. So if you can disassociate your opinions, if you can unlearn everything you thought you knew about magic, greater magic, ritual, and then read the Satanic Bible, you will truly understand what Satanic magic is all about. Um, paraphrasing, there's a core line that Anton LaVey writes. Greater magic is making change in the world that would otherwise not happen. Um, paraphrased. Greater magic allows you dominance over your reality. It allows you the opportunity to take reality and alter it per your desires. Now, desire is only part of it, okay? So creative visualization at its core is integral. That is the desire aspect. You want something and so you visualize that something to come to reality, to come to fruition, to be yours, whether it's destruction lust, or compassion. You see it in your mind. But what most people do, in my experience, to their fault, is to walk into greater magic and think that it is the end all. That by stepping into the ritual chamber, the decompression chamber, by suspending disbelief, by calling on the princes of hell by summoning the proverbial demons of our ancestors the devils that reigned 
everything that is evil. That that alone will give you everything you desire. And that's a lie. It will not. It's never claimed to be. And it's not going to happen. Um, the first and most important thing to realize as a Satanist, certainly when thinking about ritual or greater magic, in my experience, my opinion, is to realize that you are the greatest influence over your life. The way you present yourself through lesser magic, the way you manipulate your world through lesser magic is as essential as ritual and understanding at its core what ritual is there for will allow you to see what you desire come to reality. So, let's take an example. There's a girl that I would like to bed. Um, I want her. I need her. So, I perform the lesser magic that I believe will aid her into uh, coming to me. And it doesn't necessarily work. So I think if my lesser magic is not enough, maybe greater magic is in order. So I go to the ritual chamber and I suspend my disbelief and I call on the devils of our ancestors and I demand and I shout to the sky to give me, grant me the power that is mine and make this woman mine. You are not influencing that woman. Not really. And this is where there are some schools of thought. There's this sort of pseudo-satanic, or I'm sorry, pseudo-scientific version of, of ritual where, you know what, we are nothing but batteries. We are energy. We generate energy and we can direct it through ritual. And... Through that, we can influence others' reactions. We can sort of give a nudge to what normally would not be nudged. And then there are some that think it's just psychological. We do ritual, we perform ritual to clear our own minds. We may be completely blinded by our lust to realize that she doesn't want us for a reason. She wants a man for a different reason, and we have to get past our lust to see that. We have to see what people want. And if ritual is a way for you to purge the cloud of desire and to sharpen your focus, then that is what it's there for. More importantly than anything, whenever you go into the ritual chamber, you should not come out of it feeling that you left something on the table, feeling that you have more to give on the subject. You need to go into the chamber and release... <laughs> I, I've been drinking. Release all of the energy that you have built up inside of you about that one thing. You need to focus your mind and point all of your energy at that one goal and realize that the only way it's going to happen is not only through that ritual of focusing your energy, but through your practical application after said ritual, after you leave that decompression chamber, after you have expended your energy after you have rested, after you have returned to the real world, and you have taken what you have learned, not only insights from the ritual, but of clarity of mind afterward, and used it to get what you want. In this case, in this example, the girl. Now, that's just my interpretation of magic. I do not believe that it is an end-all. I do not believe that there is any supernatural, mystical, anything after performing a ritual that will go and do your bidding for you. Uh, there's a weird presumption of extra natural power there, and that's not a satanic idea at all. 
we, <laughs> the chaos, the universe, are it. And we have the ability to alter, to nudge, to shift, to sidestep. Um, and that, at its core, is what greater magic is. That, at its core, is what lesser magic is. And the practical application can be very successful. But if you, again, I'm, and I'm going to harp on this again and again and again, if you're going into this thinking that there is a Satan, or thinking that there is uh, an entity that will grant your desires simply because you performed a play very well, I'm sorry, my friend, but you're doing it wrong. It's not what it's about. It's about you clearing your mind, harnessing your energy, and directing it toward your desires. It can be very beneficial. It can. It, it can also kind of be pissing in the wind. But that's sort of the game. So don't go into it wanting a specific desire. Because sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Go into it wanting to focus your perception. To focus, to clarify your sense of purpose in this one avenue. Go into it knowing that it is only one part of a successful working. And you will always be successful. So, that's my opinion, satanic ritual magic. Thank you very much for writing in. And everyone else who writes in, if I don't speak to your letter, then I probably think it's sufficient just to reply to you, and it's not a big deal. Sometimes like this, I, I think that there's something more to speak to. And if you do have a question, please feel free to send it in. I would gladly speak to it. And I can't promise that I'll have a sufficient or... Um, worthwhile answer but I will give it my uh, well, I'll give you the old cause try <laughs> uh, I'm just a guy like all of you you know uh, continual learning continual study no one has any real final answers there is no omnipotent man in the mountains uh, experience that's key to understanding so, thank you very much for writing in, I appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed it let's go ahead and move on to the infernal informant Psst. Hey, 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 come here. Psst. What? Huh? Me? Do I know you? Hey, you're a religious man, aren't you? No more than anyone else. Listen, listen, I got a secret. It's, it's been eating me up and I gotta share it with someone. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, kid. I don't know you. No, listen, man. It's about you. It's about your life. You're about to have what, what alcoholics refer to as your moment of clarity. What are you talking about? Are you okay, son? Sins are indisposable. Every society organized on an ecclesiastical basis, they are only reliable weapons of power. The priest lives upon sins. It's, it's necessary to him that there be sinning. Who the fuck are you, kid? I'm your infernal informant. On NSA Disclosures, has Glenn Greenwald become something other than a reporter? And this is from the Washington Post... Uh, posted by Paul Fari, uh, the 23rd of June. Glenn Greenwald isn't your typical journalist. Actually, he's not your typical anything. A lawyer, columnist, reporter, and constitutional liberties advocate, Glenwald blurs a number of lines in an age in which anyone can report the news. But he has Greenwald. One of two reporters who broke the story of the National Security Agency's classified internet surveillance program. Become something other than a journalist in the activist role he is taking in the week of the NSA disclosures. Defining who he is and who isn't a journalist isn't just an academic exercise when it comes to revealing matters of top secret national security. Representative Peter T. King, a Republican in New York, the former chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, suggested earlier this month that Greenwald had stepped beyond typical journalistic boundaries and should be prosecuted 
for revealing state secrets. King didn't make the same claim about Barton Gelman, the reporter who broke the story about the NSA's PRISM program in the Washington Post. Greenwald, an American living in Brazil who writes from a British newspaper, The Guardian, has reacted combatively to such suggestions. He bristled again when asked about it Sunday by moderator David Gregory on Meet the Press. I think it's pretty extraordinary that anyone who would call themselves a journalist would publicly muse about whether or not other journalists should be charged with felonies, he said. He maintained that he had done only what other investigative journalists have long done and denied that he had in any aid and abetted Snowden in any fashion. He added that the Obama administration is trying to criminalize investigative journalism by searching the emails and phone records of Fox News reporter James Rosen and reports from the Associated Press, all of whom have worked with government sources to disclose sensitive information. Greenwald has been close to Snowden ever since the government contractor approached him anonymously earlier this year, offering to relate secret information. Snowden was apparently attracted to Greenwald's work as an opponent of the government's domestic and international security regimes since the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Greenwald did not respond to a request for comment Sunday. Although Greenwald has appeared frequently on TV to plead Snowden's case as a whistleblower, an advocacy role many mainstream journalists would be uncomfortable with, there is no evidence that he has helped Snowden evade U.S. authorities who are now seeking Snowden's arrest. WikiLeaks, on the other hand, became an active player in the international drama surrounding Snowden on Sunday. The international organization, which has dedicated itself to revealing government secrets, said that its lawyers were helping Snowden in its fight for federal prosecutors and assisting him to arrange asylum in Ecuador. The lawyers accompanied Snowden as he traveled from Hong Kong to Moscow on Sunday. WikiLeaks co-founder Julian Assange has taken refugee in the Ecuadorian embassy in London uh, he is wanted for questioning by Swedish authorities on a sexual assault case unrelated to WikiLeaks' disclosure of thousands of American military and diplomatic documents. Edward Wasserman, dean of the University of California at Berkeley's Journalism School, said having a social commitment doesn't disqualify anyone from being a journalist. But the public should remain skeptical, I'm sorry, skeptical of reporting, I'm sorry, reporters, who are also advocates. Do we know if he's pulling his punches or has his finger on a scale because some information uh, he should be reporting doesn't fit with his cause? Wasserman asked in an interview, if that's the case, he should be castigated. Uh, Wasserman said he hasn't seen that in Greenwald's involvement with Snowden. Federal prosecutors, meanwhile, have spent months questioning Army private first class I'm sorry, private first class Bradley Manning, who is accused of leaking documents to WikiLeaks to establish whether Assange's conduct goes beyond being a mere conduit of classified information. Still, the line between journalism, traditionally the dispassionate reporting of facts, and outright involvement in the news seems blurrier than ever. Greenwald, for one, has left no doubt about where he stands. This is how the government always tries to protect themselves from transparency, by accusing those who bring it of endangering national security, Greenwald said on Meet the Press on Sunday. There's been nothing that has been revealed in the NSA case that has been remotely endangering national security. The only people who have learned anything are the American people who have learned the spying apparatus is directed at them. That's the article. I've wanted to speak to this. And I have actually spoken to this in the past on a number of different um, perspectives. I, I stand on sort of rocky ground here. If information, and, and maybe, maybe I'll frame it like this. I'm a veteran. Soldier at my heart, though I don't serve anymore. I realize that there is a place for government secrets uh, to be kept both from our enemies and the public. 
I very much identify with the persona of a soldier who must do reprehensible acts to protect America. We cannot apply a civilian liberal view of the world to national defense. We can't. Because there would be no national defense if we did. We cannot apply standard government transparency when it comes to protecting the interests of national defense. We can't. Now, honestly, I believe that there's a fine line. And I believe transparency of the process, not necessarily of the information, is essential. Not only for the American public to have faith in their government and, and to have faith in, in their um, government's uh, defense of its citizens, which is the primary role of government, of federal government, protect its people. But also, the only way to have a comfortable relationship with our world partners is to have a little bit of transparency, letting them know that, yes, we are doing this, um, and, and part of it is admitting that we do have a spy program, that, yes, we are watching you. We, we are watching you. There's nothing wrong with that. They're watching us. We're watching them. That is how we all get along, and we all know everyone is sort of on even ground when it comes to economic politics, national defense politics, and, um, and, and, and really... That's kind of, you know, where it stands. Uh, we, we, we can throw in corporatist politics. Um, what Obama has done horribly is run our national defense. <laughs> oh, this guy is a freaking nightmare. Okay, so he has continued... He has continued extradition, he's continued Guantanamo, he's continued torture, he has continued dr and expanded drones, um, profile murder through the use of drones, and spying on his own citizens. I can't help but go back to that age-old quote. Um, ben Franklin, those who sacrifice liberty for the sake of security, paraphrasing here, um, deserve neither. And I've been arguing this since the Patriot Act was first suggested after 9-11 by the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, um, yelling to my fellow soldiers and lieutenants. How absurd it is to sacrifice our fucking Bill of Rights for the hope of safety and security. Um, and it's easy for the government to claim, oh, well, because we've done all of this uh, spying on our uh, populace, we have thwarted X amount of assaults. Uh, but I... I I don't know where the rest of America stands or where you, the listeners, stand. I am willing to risk assault if it means that I have a little bit of liberty. Life is dangerous. We live in a bubble here in the United States where we pretend that once a decade being bombed is the end all. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen. But there are countries where people deal with this on a daily basis. There are people who have family members that have suffered. Not just a friend of a friend who happened to be in the town where it happened. People who are um, feeling that they are under assault 
by America at this very second that can't even feel comfortable in their own homes when they hear the roaring of a drone overhead. They have to run into the streets because their building might be the next to explode from our hands. Um, I don't think that's American. I don't think that's where we started. I don't think that's where the public wants us to be. And it is this administration and the previous administration that have drove us into this insane practice of spying on our own civilians, hoping that we'll catch that one terrorist plot. Never being able to prove that it's worthwhile at all in the, in, in, in the first place at all. That's maybe the most disconcerting point of this all. And to... I, I, there's two things I want to touch on before I, I move on to the next article. I know I'm going on at length. Uh, please bear with me here. We're doing this to prevent terrorist attacks from uh, coming to fruition, all the while ignoring what causes the terrorist attacks to form in as an idea. Our own policies are the cause of these terrorist attacks, you fucking idiots. We are the ones doing it. We are bombing their homes. And so they grow angry at us and they take up the cause of militants and they strike at us. Why don't you focus on that? Instead of how to prevent them being able to successfully react to our actions. This is basic physics. Every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. We are the action, they are the reaction. And yes, you can take this in a very medieval way and say, Whoa, we didn't start it, 9-11 started it. Whoa, 9-11 didn't start it, Afghanistan started it. Well, Afghanistan didn't start it, Iran started it. Well, we can go back forever. How about taking a little bit of responsibility for our actions right now? Instead of blaming it on shit that's happened in our past. Take a little bit of responsibility as a country. And understand that we are breeding the very terrorists that we are attempting to stop. By these really invasive measures of just pure spying on our own citizens. Does this make you feel better? Does it make you feel safer? Because it doesn't make me feel either. It infuriates me. Instead of focusing on the root cause, we are trying to treat the symptom. We are the cause of the symptom. Focus on that for a second. Now, yes, there are some people out there who no matter what we do will always hate us. But that is the minority. Believe it or not. And that is a chance that I am willing to take. The minority reacting to our society. That's just reality. You have to be able to face that. Life is dangerous. A meteor could fall out of the sky. We could be hit by a car. We could choke on a fucking peanut. That's reality. It's dangerous. But when we're causing the problems... And then restricting our own populace to try to solve the result of those problems. We are the problem. We can fix it. We can address it. Just get our heads out of the our asses. Stop voting in the same assholes we continue to vote in. Start being responsible for our leaders as a population. We are the ones voting them in. We are the ones allowing them to do this. I did have another point, but <laughs> for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. Um, okay, so I'll just stop it at the one. <laughs> okay, and the second article, man, this is going to be a long episode, people. Sorry. On the streets and in the courts, Egypt's Morsi is under siege. This is uh, Heretz.com by Zvi Barel. Posted the 24th of June. Wait a second. Oh, well, 24th where they are. 
Egyptian president faces probe as possible treason charge for jailbreak on eve of one year anniversary. Oh, Morsai, you silly bastard. The, <coughs> excuse me. The decision of Ismaili Misdemeanors Appeals Court Sunday to accept the petition by opponents of Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi and thus to instruct Egyptian prosecutors to investigate how Morsi escaped from Wadi Natraun prison on the eve of Egypt's resolution is another resounding slap in the president's face by the judicial system. In the most severe case, Morsi could be sentenced to life in prison for treason. The timing is significant. On this coming Sunday, which marks the one-year anniversary of Morsi's presidency, the opposition and protest movements are planning mass demonstrations in which they will call on him to resign. Morsi has announced that he will not appear for questioning, and in doing so has added fuel to the fire of protest. One of his secular supporters, Wael Gonim, who became the symbol of the 2011 Tyre Square Revolution, has called on Morsi to step down and even said he regretted voting for him. The extent of the high alert in Egypt, Egypt ahead of Sunday's demonstrations can be seen in yesterday's announcement by Defense Minister Abdul Fattah Khalil al-Sisi. The army will not make allowances for either side and does not intend to gamble with the security of the Egyptian people. The statement was a broad hint to the Muslim Brotherhood, who activists plan to organize rallies supporting the president and opposing the protest demonstrations. The jailbreaking question took place two days before the major demonstration that sparked the uprising in Egypt in January 25, 2011, when the Interior Ministry Habib al-Adli, who is also on trial, announced that he was ordering the arrest of political activists, including senior Muslim Brotherhood members, among them Morsi and Assam el Aryan, <laughs> uh, when the protest demonstrations against the regime broke out, along with riots in Egypt's prisons, thousands of prisoners escaped after the jailers abandoned their posts or turned a blind eye to the breakout. According to official documents, more than 2,800 prisoners are still free, including two prominent Hamas figures, Ayman Nofel, a leader of the Hamas militant wing Is al-Din al-Qassam, and Mohammed Hissam, head of the Hamas military intelligence, as well as Hezbollah activists arrested and jailed in 2009 for the intent to carry out terror attacks in Egypt. Possible treason charge. Morsi claims he was never legally incarcerated, and therefore his escape cannot be deemed illegal. However, Recorded conversations supposedly between Morsi and Hamas activists could dispute his claim, and this is the most serious offense of which he could stand accused. Collaboration with foreign elements, including terrorists, to break out of jail. If Morsi is convicted of that crime, which is considered treason, the court could sentence him to life in prison. Morsi has been waging a bitter political battle over the past few weeks against his opposition, which is demanding to change the Constitution, passed in a hasty public referendum, and to hold early elections for the presidency in light of what they consider Morsi's failure to realize the aspirations of the revolution. Morsi is taking advantage of the fact that the Egyptian parliament is not now in a position to pass laws through the Shura Council, Parliament's upper house, which is controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood and its functioning as a temporary parliament. The judicial system, especially the constitutional court, has thus become a stronghold against Morsi's attempt to change laws in a way the opposition believes will bring down the country's judicial institutions. Yesterday's court decision does not seem divorced from this power struggle, although... It is too soon to tell whether legal proceedings will be exhausted since the head of the prosecution, Talat Abdallah, is a Morsi appointee. 
Meanwhile, the court's decision to ask Interpol for help in locating and apprehending the Hamas men who escaped from prison stirred up a storm in the Hamas leadership in Gaza. According to Hamas spokesman, the decision is meant to drive a wedge between Hamas and the Egyptian government and sabotage Egypt's efforts to bring about reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah. Hamas, whose activists are also suspected of involvement in the killing of Egypt's soldiers last August, has collectively become persona non grata to the Egyptian public, with government and private media outlets calling it a terror group that harms Egypt's interests, spills the blood of Egyptian soldiers, and gives Israel a pretext to carry out attacks on Egypt's soil. It's interesting. Interesting. I remember talking to you all about this when Morrissey was first allowed to be uh, brought into government by the military. And now the military is, well, none too happy. I had mentioned that, uh, well, yeah, this is sort of an old saying, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And Morrissey, of course, does not want to give up power. But how far will he go? How far will this go before the military steps in and says, well, we said we'd give you the authority, but we kind of don't really want to anymore, so we're going to have to force you. Now, right now, the army is not really taking a side. And the people of Egypt are speaking out against Morsi, even his most devout followers, those who put him into office. How long will it last before Egypt once again is in revolt? And I wonder if they ever take perspective into account. Like, well, this revolution to get him out of office, well, maybe it's, maybe it's a bad thing. But how bad were you off before compared to this? And is a little bit a little bit of uh, bending the rules, okay. I'll be interested in following this, and I will be continually bringing it to you, to your great dismay, I'm sure. <laughs> so, look forward to that in the coming future. Let's take a quick break, and on the other side, militant eroticism. Oh, yeah. Why start your mornings early when you can sleep in late and wake up later to a freshly brewed cup of Radio Free Satan? Radio Free Satan is infernally roasted with a complex taste to suit your indulgence. It's sinful. That's why it tastes great. So pour yourself another helping of this podcast and others at RadioFreeSatan.com. Welcome. This is Warlock Atreus, the host of Vox Satane on Radio Free Satan, which is celebrating its 13th anniversary this month. You just heard the opening chords of Elektra, an opera by Richard Strauss. Those opening chords cry out the name of the murdered Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, and begin every episode of Vox Satane. Vox Satane the Voice of Satan is an exploration of classical music presenting compositions written over the past thousand years. Classical music clearly speaks with the voice of Satan in the expression of both composers and performers. My hope is that you, the listener, will be tempted to undertake your own exploration of the Epicurean feast that is classical music. I want to share with you two special tracks from the past 146 episodes of Vox Satane. This first selection is from a 20th century opera called Die Tote Stadt, The Dead City, by Eric Wolfgang Korngold. Paul lives among the ruins of his life with the memory of his dead wife, Marietta. He meets a woman, Marie, who is drawn to him, but the only fascination he has for her is in how she reminds him of his dead wife. She finds sheet music of a song his wife used to sing, and he asks her to sing it for him. Carol Neblet is Marie, and Rene Colo is Paul. Lusters! 
the top hated and the low browed. With a scarlet passion and valid gospel, I say to you, thou in sick style of remote altars, be not of love, but of lust, and to one of those full ears of bellies full. Expand your gentle rebellion to vindicate the shrew. Let thy brothel be revelation, then thy moans are divine wisdom. There's no salvation in the whole's religion. Our dogma is their kink. With legs spread, with flesh mounted, we point out to our accusers, a slut alone is no slut at all. This I say to you, my fellow eroticists, my hands on borders. It doesn't matter who bends over. In the end, we are all degraded. Welcome to Militant Eroticism. I'm your host, Aden Arden, and I want to thank Adam Campbell for giving me another platform in which to spew more perversity into this already dynamic podcast, and for giving voice to my sweet little anthem, and to J.R. Tarina for giving it a fantastic soundtrack. Since this is an introductory episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and move on to the aims of this segment. Uh, first, I'd like to explain one of my little old dictums that I've been flooding Facebook with, uh, that a slut alone is no slut at all. This whole interest of mine began with myself seeking some lusty pleasures and finding many others who wished to indulge in my range of appetites. Uh, they'd often deny it in public, uh, removing themselves from the story and ridiculing me in the process uh, and the lack of shame I felt about it. Uh, so that phrase, a slut alone is no slut at all, is, I guess, my defense. I couldn't do the things I do without you being just like me. So through a few tough les uh, lessons and um, my youthful naivety, I learned that this dictum is bedrock fact and that human beings like to be in the gutter as long as no one is looking. Uh, too bad for you guys, I'm always looking. And those who've spoken with me briefly can attest to my attempts to look into their bedroom doings. I've gladly taken up a scarlet A along with a white lab coat and devoted my life to your sexual exploits, especially if you don't want to admit them. I'm working to legitimize myself and my ideas through academic institutions. What, but what could be a better place to learn about you than watching what you do and with whom and where and the silly little fairy tales you all love to tell yourselves about it. Uh, so for example, I survived high school by throwing parties for the popular kids and putting into play various psychological devices to see what would happen to them. Uh, often toying with their fetishes and desires and going through their, I can't or I couldn't, and tempting them with the exact opposite. And slowly these parties turned into uh, sex parties and orgies. So some would say I blackmail these kids because I saw everything that everybody was doing. Uh, others would say it's I provided a service regarding why suddenly everybody started leaving me alone. Uh, but either way, I, I thought, if you can't be strong, be clever. And everything I used at those parties was cultivated and distilled from spending time sitting in rest stop bathrooms and listening to the rules of engagement. Uh, I would sit in my car at rest stop parking lots and see who went in who came out, how long it took them. I would talk to prostitutes about people's secrets, uh, escorts about how they treated people and their customers, reading books on sex games, fetishes, and studies on popular fetishes. And my bookshelves are still lined with the notebooks I carried around on these little escapades. And when I was a bit younger, I had a thing for family men. So I'd spend some time with these married gentlemen behind locked doors and interviewing them in a manner uh, while satisfying whatever we were there to do. Uh, you can say that the majority of the last seven years were one huge unfunded research program. But sexual activity, gender, sexuality, these are broad topics of discussion and this allows me a lot of wiggle room. Uh, but mostly I'll concentrate on interesting little conversations I've had with people on their values and their beliefs. Uh, values and beliefs I've read about and describe the ethical implications of them. Uh, thoughts like those slogans you'll see at uh, 
gay pride marches. Uh, I can't help who I love, that kind of bullshit. And uh, monogamy is a natural state of our species, and the nuclear 2.25 family is the way we're supposed to mate and supposed to live our lives. Uh, I'll talk about people who constantly change their ethics and values without thinking about it critically in order to escape whatever moral crime they committed in whatever situation they found themselves in. An example of that would be uh, a closet case cheating on his wife because he's too big of a pussy to admit he's gay, or a woman who's cheating on her boyfriend with another guy because she wants to have two men. Uh, these, this is, this is cowardly, and to, to do what you want without conviction, self-respect, and honesty. I'll go through points of interest in behavior research, like uh, this article floating around on Facebook right now about the emotional health of people who are into BDSM uh, or bondage, discipline, sadomasochism. I'll, I'll run through a little bit of cultural and physical anthropology, a bit of evolutionary psychology, because that is the most misogynistic science out there, and there's nothing funnier than that. Uh, I'll talk about health information uh, and the controversy surrounding it. Like all over the news right now, there's this super gonorrhea that's getting ready to jump from Hawaii to the United States any day now, and there's no cure. Uh, and then AIDS denialism. Uh, the documentary, The House of Numbers, is a good representation of AIDS denialism. And then, of course, practical advice that I've gathered from the back rooms, the bath houses, and the wonderful little people who I found there and work there. Uh, in short, this segment is about science and philosophy, but applied to your genitals. <laughs> so, but... I, I talk about sex frequently, and around my friends, they, they always love to say to me, you know, I'm obsessed with sex. And half-jokingly, I always uh, respond to them saying, I'm not obsessed with sex. I'm obsessed with how you people relate to each other. It is you who is obsessed with sex, and that is how you primarily relate to each other. Uh, think about how your relationships are defined. What's the difference between a lover, a friend, a casual screw, any relationship you can think of, it almost comes down to uh, if you're screwing them, where you're screwing them, and I'm not just talking about you know places, I'm talking about body parts, um, how often, and if it's right to do so. I guess the only exception to this would be family, but then again, family is becoming such a vague term, it's, it's no, no longer meaningful in any social way, it's uh, anyone you care deeply for. So I guess in some ways people are screwing their family too, so. We can include that one. I, when people ask my credentials on things, it's, uh, I, I usually like to say, it's, I know your filthy secrets because I've been one of them. I know your fetishes because I've indulged in almost all of them. I've had evidence of your misadventures swimming in my trash can, and I'm always happy to keep what you do private and only share the stories as proof that a slut alone is no slut at all. And that's exactly what you'll get right here. So if you uh, like militant eroticism on Facebook, you'll see it uh, starting next segment. It will be flooded with articles I'll be discussing as citations. And I'll uh, include little notes that for some reason or another, I didn't get a chance to run through. You can also hear me co-host on another Radio Free Satan podcast, Naughty Bits, uh, hosted by Heather Hyde. So, but until next time, comrades, always remember, keep your skirts up, your pants down, and no matter who bends over, in the end, we're all pretty much degraded. <laughs> <laughs> very, right. very, very nice. Um, let me let me jump in here on, on a couple issues. First of all, uh, by now you've already, as the listener, already heard me uh, sing praise to this new segment. But after hearing that and, and knowing that you were a part of uh, a, like a founding core participant in Naughty Bits. Well, let me let me sort of back up. We were sort of hooked up, I'll say. We had a pimp. Yeah. <laughs> Careful of your words as, right there. <laughs> as an intermediary. So we, uh, we were hooked up, so to speak, and uh, it was a match made in a, a dirty alley um, where I was looking for voices that would contribute to the greater satanic conversation and you have a voice that speaks directly to the core of what 
some of the greatest essays surrounding Satanism uh, had at its core, and that is the human appetite, the sexual human appetite, and its its uh, the lies that we tell ourselves about it, the the dirty truths that surround it. I mean, this is everything that that you are. Uh, not only learn it in, but but willing to communicate, and and I'm very very excited to have you on the show about it. You had mentioned a couple things here, and and first before I, I sort of ask you about those, if if you're all right with it, what what made you willing to um, come on the show? Because what I don't want, and and what I know you don't want, is to parrot. Um, your other podcast we no one wants to steal any thunder from that we want to do something truly original and so maybe if you could uh, give me a brief on uh, why you were willing to to bring this segment to nine cents in its form well naughty bits is about uh, having fun with sex uh, you know heather's a comedian and i i'm just i'm a I'd be an old pervert if I wasn't old, if I wasn't young. But, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm just a horny twenty-something-year-old. Um, but that that's about uh, making sex fun uh, to talk about. It's, and we we mostly do interviews with uh, uh, people people like porn stars or who um, are sex sex experts, things like that. Here it, it's I love talking about science and philosophy, and far more seriously. When, when you go out and you start dating somebody, it's it. Relationships are like a, a job interview, and there's a value system and ethics in play, and notions like that aren't. Well, I think they're fun, but that's not what Naughty Bits wants to go for. So here is where I want to do those things. I want to have some serious discussions about. Uh, about what people are actually up to and what other cultures are actually doing um things things of that sort i I certainly appreciate it and i i did want to give that that sort of blanket explanation because i know even after having heard your introductory um show there's still going to be some people that that either didn't really listen or didn't really understand or just want to connect you with what you are absolutely known for. And so it is important to note that we are separating what Naughty Bits is doing and what militant eroticism is doing. And this is an absolute um, Adin statement and and expression, and it is not in any way um, a crossover or a mix of different podcasts. That, you know, as a blanket statement, I think is, is rather important. Yeah. Um, this segment's going to be like if you were talking to me over a glass of bourbon. Yeah. Filthy and uh, putting <laughs> your face in the fire about what you're up to. I'm so, <laughs> so looking forward to this. Um, okay. Well, so let, let me let me ask you before we wrap it up for this first introductory episode. You are open as a gay man. Mm-hmm. If you would be, and, and we, we may have touched on this um, in a previous interview that I conducted with you and Heather about Naughty Bits proper, but because this is going to be your voice solo throughout this, this segment that we're going to be airing um, once a month, um, you had mentioned during your uh, introduction that lying to oneself or, or, or maybe even trying to convince oneself of of the lies that they're leading is um is sort of a shame it's sort of an embarrassment you know just the fact that you're lying to yourself do you think that it's maybe even almost integral for a human being to be able to cope with reality to just blatantly lie to themselves no um it's i i can I can understand uh, somebody having a double life. I certainly have a double life. Um, you know, I'm something one place and I'm something somewhere else. And it's smart to do that uh, when you're trying to build a life for yourself. But to lie to yourself is something completely different. Um, 
Like in the past, there were gay men who married gay women because you had to keep up appearances and they had a private arrangement. That is fine. It is, um, you're being practical, you're being realistic. But to convince yourself and to convince someone else that you've declared to the world is your equal, which is what a wife or a husband is. They're supposed to be, your, th this is the only person that I will take a bullet for. You've tricked somebody into feeling so strongly for you that they've made a life vow, and that is despicable. Um, and then you're lying to yourself, oh no, I just, it's, uh, just, I do it every now and then. Well, yeah, sure, it's, it's like saying, yeah, I, I smoke a joint every now and then. Okay, well you still smoke marijuana, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in a guy's butt, you're still <laughs> dabbling in faggotry. This is just the way it works. <laughs> There's, this is not much of a gray area, and even if it is a gray area, we don't call it that. It's called bisexuality, and you have no right line to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I can't respect that. I, I can respect someone who makes a private arrangement with their wife, like a few, uh, uh, one, of, one of my friends with benefits, he has a wife, and um, she knows, they have their rules, and she's bi too, so she, she sleeps with girls. And it's open and it's honest. I met her. I met his wife, and uh, she makes me pie. I, I, that's kind of nice. <laughs> so I get her husband, and I get her food. I can't. I can't think of anything better than open honesty. <laughs> nice. nice. So that, that's that's the difference. Is are you being practical, realistic, or are you just being a coward and a liar? Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's always that clear cut for the individual doing it? Uh, well, not for the individual. Uh, that's lying to themselves now. Self-deceit isn't really clear-cut if it's in your own head, because you're starting to rationalize everything. It's like it's almost like an alcoholic t telling himself he doesn't drink. He's not addicted to drinking. Yeah. But th that's another conversation. But you get the gist. Yeah, um, absolutely. Right. I'm not well, addicted to smoking. I just like smoking a pack and a half a day. <laughs> I can stop whenever I want. What are you talking that's, about? That's right. <laughs> I'm in control. You know, I, I absolutely understand that. And I, I completely agree. It's that it's a very satanic notion of being honest to yourself about who you are. And I, again, I do believe, I mean, it's practical lesser magic to be at times uh, necessary to be completely dishonest with those around you about who you are. But you're doing that open with, with open eyes. You know, you are still aware of who you are. It's the it's the lying to yourself part that's that's uh, absolutely unforgivable and, and truly a sin, um, in my opinion. I'm absolutely looking forward to next month's episode. Thank you so much for uh, bringing your voice to Nine Cents. And for everyone out there, it's happened, people. Uh, look forward to it. Militant eroticism is knocking at your fucking door. Forget Avon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until next month, man. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. And that's it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. We're also on Last.fm, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube, so look for us there. You can subscribe to 9 cents via iTunes by searching 9 cents and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, music, or personalities, visit radiofreesatan.com, the source for online satanic media. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I am your host, Adam Campbell. And until next week, hail Satan. <laughs>